So our final presenter was a Vancouver city planner with major projects, went to London to work for the Duke of Westminster, the largest landowner in London, came back to Vancouver and established his company, Livable City Planning, where he has 5,000 units of housing he's working to bring to reality. He brings in important insights from both sides of the planning desk. He was the last graduate student of Walter Hardwick, the icon of Vancouver Urban Planning, and he helped Jane Jacobs write her last book. Please welcome Michael Mortensen. Immersion order in the livable city. My thesis here is that um, we, we, we can't have order without design. We can't have design without order. I'm the balancing speaker, I think, to conclude this thing and say that urban planners have to pay a lot more attention to market forces. Developers have to pay a lot of attention to design naturally to get anything built. You have to be an expert at design. And when I say design, I don't just mean architecture. I mean the DNA of cities, the urban plans, the policies, the guidelines, the rules, the fees, the CACs, all of those things. But I find urban planners have historically not been very great at market economics. We need to fix that because we have huge problems. So order without design, Alan Berto's book is fantastic, um, you know, tracking the, the, the the forces of markets on cities, and absolutely we need to be better at understanding them. Um, order without design. Would you like to live in a city that, ha that is predicated only on order? So the cover of Alan's book is Jakarta, which has got rapid urban growth, congestion, gridlock traffic, and flooding, and is no longer going to be the capital of Indonesia because it's being moved. Uh, that doesn't exactly work. So order without design is not a great idea, but you have to pay attention to the forces of order. Um, cities are complex open systems. They're often near equilibrium. You think they're stable, but they're not. You know, we went through deindustrialization, the post-industrial revolution. I think we're going through another one right now in terms of the way people work. People are changing the way they're working, changing the way they can live, which then changes the shape of our cities. Our cities are shaped by both markets and regulation. Um, as, as, um, as Sam mentioned, uh, I, I knew Jane Jacobs a little bit. I helped her edit her last book. She's a bit grumpy, dark age ahead. <laughs> um, but she talks about moral systems, um, uh, the systems of commerce and the systems of governance, two different ones. But order versus design is a false dichotomy. People value design, markets value design. If you, do, if you develop buildings, you know this, that you need to pay attention to design. But design, let's think about the DNA of our cities and the rules that, uh, that guide them. It's a balance of interests, right? We need to look at design, costs, values, what society wants. You can't build things in a vacuum. And uh, I think our market is telling us that we are, we are at failure point in terms of equity and the way that development is affecting everybody. We need to change it. 25 years ago almost, I took this article to the Congress of the New Urbanism. I was a, a plenary speaker, a young graduate student, didn't know what I was talking about, and where, where I met Jane Jacobs. And, um, and this is an article with Arthur Erickson saying, well, we're gonna get a million people in the region. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna grow? And that, that is a question we have to have again. Um, and indeed, we did get almost a million people in the last 25 years, just as, just as he predicted. Um, his wish, I think, was that Vancouver would accept more of that growth, but that hasn't been the case. The suburbs have been absorbing all that growth. But as everyone knows, you know, all roads lead to Rome, all spokes in the hub lead to the center of Vancouver. Everyone wants to live in the center. The pressure in the Vancouver is pretty, pretty phenomenal. This is a livable region strategy. It goes back to the early 70s. Back to that question of how should our city grow? As a, as a region, we said, look, we know we have these market forces, but we need to shape them. So, you know, we have this tension between design, the DNA of all of our cities, and market forces. So, yeah, so to harness the energy of markets, this is Aikido. You know, we know we can harness the energy of markets to better understand market forces and leverage the language of economics and design to create better cities. Not just Vancouver, all over the region. So we go back to Jane Jacobs' moral syndromes. There's one of guardians, right? They're there to present, prevent bad things from happening. Historically, that's where planning comes from. You know, the unfettered excesses of capitalism are leading to crappy cities all over Canada, all over the world, England. You know, they brought urban planning to Canada in the early 1900s. And then there's the moral systems of commerce, you know, trade. So these two systems. So which one are you? You know, who's the, who's the trader and who's the guardian? Well, it depends on your perspective. 
if you're submitting a development application, um, maybe you're the Wookiee. I don't know, <laughs> you know, you're building rental housing, trying to address the housing deficit. Um, from the perspective of the planners, they see, sometimes they see developers as the Klingon. But uh, at the end of the day, it is meaningless because it's a false dichotomy. We need both. So we need to be design literate. Developers have to be design literate. I think most developers are pretty good at that. I'm a, I'm a planner developer. I'm a weird hybrid. Maybe I'm a Wookiee Klingon, I don't know, some sort of half and half thing. But guardians need financial literacy. And really, you know, a good example is San Francisco, inclusionary zoning, 2015. The guardians of the day, well, including the city council, said, look, that's it. 25% of all new units are going to be deeply affordable. What happened? That year, zero new building permits for the city of San Francisco. Who won? Nobody, right? So clearly, guardians weren't paying attention to market forces. Local example, Patrick, you're here. We, we spar, we're online, we're in the TIE. But this is from Sick City, um, which has got some sick math. So Patrick says, 60,000 a year will finance a $450,000 mortgage, 20-year mortgage at 3%, which leaves $250 a square foot buildable for the land. Wrong. $66,000 doesn't fund $450,000 mortgage. If you have Excel, P at PMT is the function, calculates your mortgage for you, it actually funds less than $300,000 for a mortgage. So we need basic financial literacy, especially if we're advising councils, politicians, uh, developers, you know, you need to be, ba you have basic financial literacy. So the $250 land residual, when you actually apply the math and you include all the costs imposed by guardians, so city fees, metro fees, TransLink, um, taxes, provincial fees, not even including GST or property transfer tax on the sale of these things, is 10% of the, the price. The, the land residual is not 250 a square foot, it's 130. So we need to get real, and I'm offering my services, to Patrick, wherever you are, for free. <laughs> we need to collaborate, right? We can't be Wookiees, we, we can't be Klingons, we have to be people to solve all these problems. So we need a responsibility to do accurate work, we need to tackle market problems with a language of mar urban land economics and the type of um, information that Alan is, uh, is sharing with us. We need to collaborate more. Um, and we have a lot of company. Planners have a lot of company in the regulation of markets um, because we're, we're, economists are also involved in this at the federal level, provincial level, regional level, TransLink, and, and all the sort of cities. You know, I think we all have to play in the same sandbox. So um, right now, I think the, the challenge is we've got all of this turbulence in our housing market. You know, all this market information, demand, um, I, I would characterize our market as low supply and high cost. And what, what, what's making it difficult and challenging for the development, development industry is that we have layers of regulation all doing other things, sometimes canceling each other out, but I would characterize it as turbulence because we have to pay more attention to the market outcomes of regulation. So um, time, this is one of the big problems, I, I'm, and time is my problem right now. Our plans are dated, right? They're ancient. Why are we listening to Harlan Bartholomew, who's 130 years old, telling us how we're going to live, when a house in Vancouver is a million, uh, 1.7 million, it's like a benchmark price for a house? Guess what? You need $300,000 of income to afford that, reasonably. You know, it's not sustainable. This is a, a massive economic equity planning failure for Vancouver, but also other cities in the region. So, radical idea. Why don't we put in a requirement that every land use zone has to meet an economic equity test, right? A market key performance indicator that if the zoning that's in place doesn't generate housing that's affordable to say, I don't know, a third of the population, then we have to throw it out. We cannot have that zoning. So RS1 zoning is classic. So I gotta close up in a minute or two, but listen, if you want vitamin A affordability, you're gonna need some vitamin D squared, density and design. We need to adapt to the market forces. We need to harness them. Single family zoning is dead. We need to break rules on the way we build small units and more compact livable units that are more affordable. We need to challenge our guardian thinking and respond to market forces. We can design with order. And that's my closing statement.